God does. Now, I think that's a fair statement, Amen. okay? Amen. That's Amen. not a pro-King James statement. That's not a pro-original statement. <clears throat> but very simply, uh, don't put more emphasis on the originals than God does. Uh, I'll give you an example. When you put more, more emphasis on something than God does, you end up with an idol. Mm. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Was Mary the mother of Jesus Christ? Yes. yes. Amen. Was Mary a virgin when Jesus was born? Yes. Amen. Was Mary a perpetual virgin the rest of her life? No. no. Was Mary the mother of God? Yes. No. No, God was around before Mary. So two of those four are correct, right? But the Catholic Church believes all four. Right. And when you believe all four, when you put more emphasis on Mary than God does, you end up with statues in your yard. Right. Okay? I mean... You know, I don't care if it's dark and scary as long as I got magnetic Mary. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I was walking on the street one time and I saw this, I saw Mary standing in this yard. And I said, Mary, what are you doing there? She said, Rigatoni, totally, I don't know. And uh, but she did have the worst case of heartburn I'd ever seen. But, uh, uh, but the paint was peeling off her nose. I mean, it was right down to the plaster or concrete. I want to knock on those people's door and say, excuse me, but your God needs repainted. <laughs> you guys have a God you got to repaint? I, we preach repent, they preach repaint. <clears throat> but, uh, uh, so anyway, so if you will, if you put more emphasis on something than God does, you're going to end up with an idol. Right. So, wouldn't it be nice, wouldn't it be nice if we had some way of finding what the emphasis that God puts on the original? Finding God's opinion of the original. Guys, if we're going to have that, we're going to have one of two ways. We're either going to, we're either going to have God glow in our bedroom and have Him tell us what He thinks. <laughs> okay? If He's glowed in any of your bedrooms, don't tell us. <laughs> or He's going to speak from this book because this book is our final authority in what? Yeah, you know when we say, here's our problem. We say that statement too lightly. We say the Bible is my final authority on matters of faith and practice. What that means is, that's where I get my doctrine from. No. It's your final authority. You know what final means? That means it doesn't matter what your opinion is, what my opinion is, this one speaks last. That's right. It is all right, people. Look, I, I know you're Bible believers, and I'm going to say something. You're going to think that it's going to sound uh, uh, horrible, but it is all right to disagree with God and the Bible as long as you know who's wrong. <laughs> really, really, that's the thing. If you're going to tell me, oh, I agree with everything I read in the Bible, you don't read your Bible. You do not read your Bible. There are things that, that God does uh, that I don't agree with. There are things in the Bible that I don't agree with. But I want you to know something. The Bible is always right, and whenever I disagree with it, I am wrong. Okay? Amen. So what that means is if you say, well, here's how I think it ought to be done, you can think anything you want. But if that book has a different process to take care of something than you do, then you're wrong. Right. This is Amen. the final authority in all matters. Amen. Amen. All matters. Say, what kind of matters? Oh, matters like archaic words. Amen. Uh, matters like what to do with the originals. All right? Uh, matters on what you saw last night, <clears throat> where our manuscripts come from. So, the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. practice. So if the Bible has a practice, then that is the practice that we should follow. So uh, here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> we are, there's one place in the Bible that we can actually watch an original as it is written, and we can follow it all the way through its life. That's what we're going to do. A uh, short life, by the way. Uh, take a look at Jeremiah chapter 36. And in Jeremiah chapter 36... Uh, it says this, It came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, uh, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, uh, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against uh, Israel, against Judah, and against all the nations, uh, from the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. Now I want you to notice verse 4. I want you, we're going to kind of come back to that uh, this time period. This happens in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, and Jeremiah is told to write a book, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, but when he's done writing, what he's got is the original. Yes. Amen. Okay? Yes. So, <clears throat> he writes the original, and we can, we can follow this one. Now, watch what happens to this original. Uh, look at verse 17. Um, uh, Baruch, who was uh, actually the writer of this book, 
uh, at, uh, at the uh, bidding of Jeremiah, says this. They asked Baruch, saying, uh, Tell us now, how didst thou write all these words in his mouth? Then Baruch answered them. Uh, <clears throat> um, he pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. Then said the princes unto Baruch, Go, hide thee, uh, thou and Jeremiah, let no man know where you be. And they went into the king, into the court, but they laid up the roll in the chamber of Elisha, the scribe, and told all the words in the ears of the king. So the king sent Jehudai to fetch the roll, and he took it out of Elisha, the scribe's chamber. And Jehudai read it in the ears of the king, <clears throat> and in the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. Now here's what I want you to picture. I want you to picture, here's the king, he is listening, and here's Jehudi, and he's reading this thing. He's reading what Jeremiah wrote. And um, look what takes place in verse 23. And it came to pass that when Jehuda had read three or four leaves, he cut it with a penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth. Now let me clear something up. Jehudi didn't cut or burn anything. Okay? No. Amen. Uh, you're going to have to keep reading the book. Don't yeah. look. Don't interpret everything by what one verse says. Amen. And I'm going to tell you who did this. Jehoiakim. Jehudi's yeah. reading, and Jehoiakim hears this. He don't like what he hears, and he takes this thing out of Judy's hand. He cuts it up, and he throws it on the hearth. And I'll prove that in just a moment with a few, with a few scripture. <clears throat> but but just using logic. Now we're allowed to use logic. Of course, some of you I'm not sure I trust you, but <laughs> but um, but logic. Imagine that you are reading something to a king. You know what a king is? He is a sovereign. Yeah. He is the number one boss in the country, correct? Could you imagine you're reading something to the king and you don't like it? And you go, oh, this is awful. And you slash it and you throw it in the fire and the king goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I wanted to hear the rest. Get it. <laughs> right? You don't have any business cutting something up and throwing it away when you're reading it for the king. That's not your job. Right, right. But what I want you to notice, though, is what happened to the original? Yep. It got burned up. Right? So, <clears throat> the original ended up in the fire. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to be a little more international. Um, <laughs> this is the international symbol for fire. It looks like a bunch of sharks, like a, you know, like a news media convention. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, so that's in there. That's metric for all you people that can't uh, read, speak English, get out of the country. But, uh, <clears throat> All right, so it ended up in a fire. Now, now here's the first defense. The first defense is this. Well, that was a wicked king that did it. It wasn't God that did it. God couldn't stop it. <laughs> now, now, come on, guys. Will That's you, right. Will you put your remote down long enough to think? <laughs> you think that God was watching him read that? He's watching from heaven, and all of a sudden, Jehoiakim gets it up, cars it up, throws it in the fire, and God goes, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, man. He burned the Bible. All right, so God could have stopped him, couldn't he? Amen. That's okay. That's not what God did. Watch what he did. <clears throat> Look at verse 27. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after. Watch what it says, people. This is your final authority. After that, the king had burned the roll. And the words which Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, Take thee again another roll, and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll which... <clears throat> Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, hath burned. Mm -hmm. So what did he do? What did God do? This inspired another original. Mm -hmm. Right? So what we have here now is what I call original number one. And you know what God just did? He just inspired <coughs> original number two. Correct? Yes. Okay, and, and uh, in fact, take a look at what it says in verse 32. <clears throat> then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which, Jeremiah, uh, which Jehoiakim king of Judah had burned in the fire, and there were added beside unto them many like words. So he not only, he not only uh, re-inspired this original, you know, look, I can tell you something, if you don't write books... You have no idea how hard that is. Um, up to uh, up to this year, the most I ever lost when I was writing was four pages. Uh, I'd be writing a book and I forgot to save them, <clears throat> and uh, something happened. I'd lose four pages of a book. You have no idea how hard it is 
to get four pages of a book back the way you just wrote it. Yeah. This year, I, I had a crash and lost 40 pages. Mm -hmm. And that is an absolute disaster. You can never rewrite those 40 pages as they were. God doesn't have that problem. Amen. But notice, yeah. it, it doesn't even say that he, he, he not only re-inspired it, he even had some words added, correct? <laughs> I, I've often joked, I wonder if they were in italics. <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> anyway. Now look, guys, if you were God, and you're not, but if you were God, you got enough sense to know this. I inspired an original, and it got burned. Don't you think you take good care of this one now? I mean, you know, if you ever did something, uh, you know, if you ever laid your car or your, your, your Bible on top of your car and drove off, you only do that once. And then you're very careful. You will, uh, you know, you start talking to somebody in the church parking lot, put your Bible on top of the car, I drove off, found it two blocks after you dumped it off, you know. And now when somebody walks up to you in the park while I'm talking, you go, wait a second, you open up the door, throw it in your seat, then you close the door. You're a little more careful. I would think God's going to be a little more careful with this because He knows that a wicked king destroyed it once. Well, would you like to know what this said? Wouldn't you be interested in knowing what that original said? Well, the fact is that you have a copy and it's in your lap. Look at Jeremiah chapter 45. Jeremiah chapter 45. <clears throat> and look at this, verse 1. The word that Jeremiah the prophet spake unto Baruch the son of Neriah, when he had written these words in a book at the mouth of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim the son of Josiah king of Judah said. Remember when we read that in Jeremiah chapter 36 verse 1? <clears throat> that, was, that was our time lock. That was our, our thumbtack. So we know when this thing, what, what this thing was and when it was written. So in your Bible, Jeremiah chapter 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, and 51 are the text of this original, okay? Now, <clears throat> watch this. Take a look at the end of uh, chapter 51. Jeremiah chapter 51 Verse 61. It says, And Jeremiah uh, said to Sarai, When thou comest to Babylon, and shalt see, and shalt, and shalt read all these words. So he's telling Sarai, he says, You go to Babylon, read this thing. He says, You take us to Babylon, read this out of Then shalt thou say, O Lord, thou hast spoken against this place to cut it off, <clears throat> that none shall remain in it, uh, neither man nor beast, but that it shall be desolate forever. And it shall be, when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone to it and cast it into the midst of Euphrates. Guys, you ever drop your Bible in a bathtub? <laughs> it's not good form, right? So what happened to the second original? It ended up in the water. You know, some by the water, some by the flood, some through the fire. Not as good as uh, not as good with water. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so so the very first original ended up in the fire, and that was done by a wicked king, correct? Mm -hmm. Who did this one? That was a bidding of God. Mm -hmm. The prophet of God that wrote the thing said, "When you're done reading it, go throw it in the river." That's what he did with the original. Didn't he know that that a bunch of fundamentalists were going to be looking for this thing someday? <laughs> But there's a, there's a great question we have to have answered. Let me ask you, do you have Jeremiah chapters 45 through 51 in your Bible? Yes. Yeah. Where'd you get them? The <laughs> well, you didn't get them from this one because it got burned. You didn't get them from this one because it got thrown in the river. How did you get a copy of, of that book when both originals were destroyed? Well, obviously, somewhere along the line, God inspired original number three. And I don't know where it is, and I don't know what it is. You know that if you could find, if, you, if, they, if they came today and said, uh, hey, we were digging in a cave in, uh, in Israel, and we found the original manuscript for Jeremiah chapter 45 through 51, you could say, no, that's at least the third one. That's right. right? Amen. That's at least the third one. And so here's what you find out as far as God is concerned about the original. 
once the words have been copied. He did either one of two things. Either this was copied before it was thrown in the river or God re-inspired it. We, we, he already showed he could do that. That's right. He either re-inspired it after it was destroyed or he, or he copied it before it was destroyed. <coughs> either way. I, the Bible doesn't tell us which. <clears throat> but if it was copied, then we see that once the words are copied, God doesn't care about the original. We put more of an emphasis on the original than God does. Right. And I know, I know sometimes, you know, we King James Bibleers, in our preaching, we want to really emphasize how much we believe the Bible. We go, I believe the Bible! I believe where it says, Holy Bible! Bless God! I believe it's a Holy Bible! I mean, I believe it cover to cover! I even believe the cover where it says Moroccan leather! I believe it's Moroccan leather! I believe it's India paper! I don't care if it's Moroccan leather. I don't care if it's India paper. You understand? I don't care. I care about the words. Amen. If the words are preserved, then, then you can pitch the original. Really? Now, I wouldn't do that. If somebody came down this aisle right now with a wheelbarrow, had a bunch of old manuscripts, and they said, uh, look at this, man. We found the originals. You know what I would do? Here's exactly what I'd do. I'd come down here by this wheelbarrow, and I'd say, uh, this is really the original. Yeah, and then once I verified, I'd go, uh, look at that, that room's on fire. And when they looked over there, I'd rip a piece off, put it in my pocket. <laughs> well, you better believe, wouldn't you like a piece of the original? <laughs> I mean, I would like, I'd, I'd tear off a little corner when he wasn't looking, and I'd stick it in my pocket. When it came time to preach, you know what I'd say? You want to park that over there out of the way so I can preach out of the words of God. Right. Yeah. Amen. We don't need that. Right. So God, God Himself even destroyed the original. All right? Have you ever heard this uh, along this line? We're going to be talking about the originals today. Uh, along this line, and, and guys, look, be careful of defining the Bible by statements that are not in the Bible. Okay? Happens a lot in Bible college. A uh, guy goes to Bible college, and, um, and you know, a King James Bible believer will be there, and he'll go, well, you know, you've got to remember something, Sonny. Uh, your Bible is just a translation, and a translation cannot be inspired. How many of you ever heard anybody say that a translation cannot be inspired? Okay. Now, here's the problem with that statement. There's no place in the Bible that it says a translation cannot be inspired. Well, don't answer this. Don't answer this because see, your, your prejudice is going to get in the way. You want to say, well, I think a translation can be inspired. No, you think that because you want to you apply inspiration to the King James Bible. Right? right? So you've got be, you to be honest about your dishonesty. So the question is, can a translation be inspired? Now, now let me explain. Uh, let me explain my definition. This is my definition. You do not have to buy into this. But this is my definition of inspiration. Alright? Inspiration is you got uh, Inspiration is you got a blank sheet of paper you, and, and you got a man and you got God and you know what God does? God says write this so the guy writes. And what he writes is inspired. We call that the original. Okay? Preservation is taking what was already inspired And preserving it. Okay? Now, <clears throat> I personally, I personally do not claim inspiration for the King James Bible. I don't claim uh, inspiration for the King James Bible for this reason. This is, uh, this is preservation. According to this definition, you don't have to accept this definition. I do. It's mine. Uh, you don't have to accept this definition, <clears throat> but according to this definition, here's what this is. The originals are uh, Psalm 12, verse 6. 
The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in furnace birth purified seven times. Verse 7, preservation. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation, this generation forever. If the King James Bible was inspired as I have shown you by this definition, then the King James translators could have sat down in a room with a blank sheet of paper with, with no Greek and no Hebrew and no other English translations and no Spanish and French and German other translations. They could have sat down uh, with a blank sheet of paper and waited for God to speak to them and written this book. Guys, that historically is not what happened. The second reason is, and think about this, if the King James, this, if this King James inspired, it was inspired in 1611. Right? Mm -hmm. Then it's running in parallel and in competition to whatever David was talking about when he said, from this generation in Psalm 12, verse, verse 7. So I say that the, the originals were inspired, the King James is a preservation, it is the preserved Word of God. Now, I had a guy come up and he asked me this one time. He said, well, would you say that the King James Bible is inspired in that it is a preservation of the inspired word? And I said, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, absolutely not use the word. I said, I don't use it by this definition. If you want to find some way to call it inspired, <clears throat> that's fine. But that still doesn't answer the question, can a translation be inspired? The fact is that there are probably 30, at least, inspired translations. Mm -hmm. At least. I'm going to show you three of them. And, and what I tell people when I teach this stuff, <clears throat> now notice we're, it's, it's going to be all from the Bible. And what I tell people is that you may disagree with, I'm, with, with what I'm going to show you, but you cannot refute it. Okay? You will not refute what I'm going to show you. Uh, go, go in your Bible to uh, Genesis chapter 42. Genesis chapter 42. Now, if you're familiar with your Bible, you know that back in uh, Genesis chapter 37, <clears throat> Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. And he is, <clears throat> he's been down in Egypt for years. And these guys show up. And you know all the stuff that he did. Your spies, you know, and all this other. And, he, and, he, and he, he really gives them a hard time. And I've heard people say, boy, he was getting even with his brothers. No, he wasn't. I don't, believe, I don't believe Joseph was getting even with his brothers. I don't think he was vindictive. Wasn't he a type of Christ? Yeah. Well, those aren't attributes of our Christ. Look, you know, I tell people to read the Bible all the time. You know what I tell them to do? Get out of your chair when you read the Bible. Get out of your chair and enter, enter the scene that you're reading. An example, how about being Joseph in Genesis chapter 37 when you were sold into slavery? Now, you wouldn't be going, ah, dirty rat. You know what you'd be thinking? How do you explain this to my dad? I wonder, and all these years in Egypt, you know what he's saying? I wonder if they killed my dad. I mean, why wouldn't he think that? They were talking about killing him. I wonder if, my, if they tried to give my dad a story. My dad didn't buy it. I wonder if they killed him. I wonder if they killed my brother Ben. I mean, he was my one brother, just like me, same dad, same mom. And if they hated me, I wonder if they killed Ben. Then when these guys show up, who's not there? Ben and his dad. And he wants to know, oh no. So what does he say? Now come on guys, let me ask you a question. If ten guys showed up and said, we're brothers, would you say, you got another brother? <laughs> would that, is that a natural question? Amen. No. He's got ten guys standing here saying, we're all brothers. He goes, really? You got another brother? <laughs> they went, yeah. Is he alive? Yeah. And he's thinking, how do I know? What about your dad? Is he alive? Yeah, yeah, we left him back home. How do I know? He ain't going to believe these guys. <laughs> but he believed Ben. Right. I'll tell you what, I'm going to keep this guy, and you bring this brother of yours, I want to see him. I think about it, he wants to find out if Ben's dead. You know what I've often wondered? What problems did Joseph and Simeon have? <laughs> Because he was the one he kept. But, uh, <clears throat> but <laughs> And then, when Ben gets there, what does he say? Is your dad still alive? Yeah. Now you know what he wants to know? I wonder if they want to get rid of Ben. See, here's what he's trying to find out. He's trying to find out what these guys did to me. It was done for one of two reasons. And what was the reason? Was it, was it that these guys are really evil and wicked? Or was it just one of those dumb things you do in your youth? Come on. Everybody in this room has done some stupid things in their youth. Yeah. Right? 
I mean, you just do something stupid. And did they do something stupid at the spur of a moment, or are they really wicked and evil? So I want to know if they want to get rid of Ben. So he throws his cup in his sack. He sends them all down the road, tells his guy, go search the sacks. <clears throat> and, and he says, now look, whoever we find this, this cup in, he's going to be our slave. And, and when they pulled that cup out of Ben's sack, if his brothers would have went, oh, Ben, man, you messed up. Well, you know, nothing we can do about that. We'll explain to Dad. You, you blew it. But no, what did they do? They came back and they said, no, no, please don't. You know what Judah said? Judah said, keep me, keep me. Don't, don't keep him. This will kill my dad. That's when he realized it was just something stupid they did in their youth. Cost him a life. But it was something they did stupid in their youth. So, <clears throat> so that's, why, that's why Joseph did the things he did. He wasn't tormenting them. He wasn't getting even with them. He needed to know, is my dad alive or did they kill him? Is my brother alive or did they kill him? Or do they want to get rid of my brother? So, but here's what's going on. He's talking to them saying, you're spies, you're spies. They're saying, no, we're true men. Yeah, you're spies. No, we're true men. But look what it says. And, and so they're discussing. You know what they're discussing? Now guys, look. You do something bad in your youth, and 20 years later something will happen in your life, and you'll go, I wonder if this is because of when I... Yeah. yeah. Look what it says, verse 22. Or verse 21. And they said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother. They're bringing up Joseph. He's standing right there. They don't even know it. We're guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child? And you would not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. They are standing here in front of Joseph, and they're going back and forth in Hebrew. And look what it says in verse 23. And they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. Okay. Need some space here? There goes the original. Look how easy. <laughs> well, you had your chance right there, guys. There goes another original. I'm wiping them all out today. All right. Now, Joseph spoke. Egyptian, when he dealt with his brother, correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, there's an Egyptian here who's the interpreter. And he spoke Hebrew. Correct? Yes. All right, don't answer this. I know you think your, your, your opinion's important. Not. Okay? But you're allowed to form the opinion in your head. How many of you think that what Joseph spoke in Egyptian was inspired? How many of you think what the Egyptian spoke in Hebrew was inspired? Well, this is not the whole pot. There's one more element. Who wrote the book of Genesis? Most of us. And what language did he write it in? Hebrew. All right. Now I'm going to let you vote. How many of you say, and don't be afraid of being wrong, okay? You're not going to be put out of church. You don't have to pay double tithe or anything. <laughs> How many of you say what, and I know somebody's going to just vote yes on all of them because you want to show us your, you know. How many of you think what Joseph spoke in Egyptian was inspired? Okay. How many of you think what the Egyptian spoke in Hebrew was inspired? How many of you think what Moses wrote in Hebrew was inspired? Okay, you know what the answer is? It doesn't matter what you think. <laughs> really, that is the answer. The answer is, it doesn't matter what you think. But while you continue to think, if we do, if, we, if I get you thinking, I figure I've done something. Uh, take a look at this. Go to um, Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. Now as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> uh, last night, Acts, in Acts chapter 21, the Apostle Paul was arrested, okay? And <clears throat> at the end of the chapter, he wants to explain his side of the story to the Jews. 
So he asks the uh, centurion's uh, permission, and it's granted. And look what it says in verse 40. And when he had given him license, when the centurion told Paul he could speak, <clears throat> and when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, starting with Acts chapter 22, verse 1, Paul speaks Hebrew. And everything in Acts chapter 22 from verse 1 to verse 21 was spoken in Hebrew. Look at verse 21. And he said unto them, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And they gave him audience unto this word. So, so, so Acts chapter 22 verses 1 through 21 were spoken by the Apostle Paul in Hebrew. So Paul spoke Hebrew. Oh, by the way, you know that there is not a uh, copy of Genesis anywhere? There's not a copy of Genesis found anywhere in history that has what Joseph spoke written in Egyptian. You know, there's not an extant manuscript of the book of Acts that has the first 21 verses in Hebrew. Oh, who wrote, who wrote the book of Acts? Luke. You guys are really afraid to answer, but I'm not going to trick you guys. I'm not, you all know Luke wrote it. And one guy answers. One pastor is brave enough to say, Luke, what do you think I'm going to say? You liar. <laughs> I'll tell you, I understand more. Paranoid crowd. All right, Luke wrote in Greek. Okay, here comes your vote. How many of you say what Paul spoke in Hebrew was inspired? How many of you say what Luke wrote in Greek is inspired? But you know the answer. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. See, we don't need your opinion and we don't need your vote. We know what we need. We need a final authority Amen. in all matters of faith and practice. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Here's a scripture you may never have heard before. It says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The Bible says that it is Scripture. It is Scripture that is inspired. Scripture is writing. So guys, what Moses wrote in Hebrew was inspired. That was Scripture. What Luke wrote in Greek was inspired. That was Scripture. Guess what? That's two inspired translations. Because they were translations. What, what Moses wrote in Hebrew was a translation of what Joseph had speak, spoken in Egyptian. What Luke wrote in Greek was a translation of what Paul had spoken in Hebrew. Now, <clears throat> some years ago, uh, I was at a, at a service <laughs> after church. I was dealing with a young pastor who used the NIV. And, um, and, and in talking, he, he, met, he said this to me. He said, well, you have to remember... The King James Bible is a translation, and a translation can't be inspired. So I showed him this, and I showed him this. Now the man was just a little less than honest. Here's what he said. Well, I agree with you that what Moses wrote in Hebrew was inspired, and what Luke wrote in Greek was inspired, but since those were inspired, or that was original inspiration, then it wasn't really a, a, an inspired translation. Now, I thought we weren't supposed to dance. <laughs> now that was a pretty good job. But I didn't answer that that way. Here's, let me tell you what happens. Every now and then I'll be reading my Bible and the Lord will show me something and He just does not let me show anybody. And I will, I will have something that I will, I will just wish to tell people about four, five, six, seven years and the Lord just doesn't give me any, uh, any um, uh, grace to do it. And there was something probably five or six years previous to talking to this young man <clears throat> that, um, that the Lord had showed me and, and it was really good. It was really good. And the Lord never, even when I was teaching on the King James Bible, He never gave me the grace, He never gave me the liberty to tell anybody. And when this kid said that, God said, go for it. Tell him. I said, okay, I will. Now, I asked, before I did this, I, I trapped him. Uh, I won't trap you. <laughs> well, I'm serious, I won't trap you. But if you don't believe the book, I'm going to trap you. That's right. Okay? 
I mean, if you're going to be an adversary of that book, yes, I'm going to trap you. Uh, I, I trap them all with my very first question. Do you accept the Bible as your final authority in all matters of faith and practice? That's a trap. Understand? Right. You say, oh, because you're going to get them committed to believing that book? No, I'm going to get them to see that they don't really subscribe to that statement. Mm. That's what I'm going to yeah. do. So I ask this. Now, you guys know this. You know that most fundamentalists, etc., <clears throat> their definition of inspiration is God-breathed. You ever hear that? Yeah. Yes, it's the breath of God. And so I trapped him. I said, well, now, don't you think that inspiration is God-breathed? Oh, yes. I said, so, now think, guys. If God speaks it, it's got to be inspired. It's coming from God, right? Yeah. You know, these guys think that, that inspiration is God-breathed. They just think God's got bad breath. <laughs> All right? I told him, open your Bible to uh, Acts chapter 24. No, Acts chapter 26. Go to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. And here's what Paul is doing. He is, he is talking to Agrippa. And he is relating to him uh, his testimony of having been saved on the road to, uh, to Damascus. And he says this in verse 13. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me, <clears throat> and them uh, which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? All right, God. He's, this happened back in Acts chapter 9, right? Right? Yeah. Not a trick. Okay. So, in Acts chapter 9, when God knocks Paul down on the road to Damascus, he speaks to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against bricks. He said that in Hebrew. That's right. So God spoke Hebrew, correct? Yep. Now, guys, we don't have to worry about a vote on this one. Is that inspired? Yeah. That's got to be inspired. Yeah. Who wrote Acts? <laughs> What language? Greek. Greek. And that's got to be inspired. So there's inspired original and inspired translation. Correct? I told you I would show you three inspired translations. Now, you know what my final authority, my final authority, not my college professor? I mean no college professor. If a college professor stands up and says a translation cannot be inspired, that doesn't mean anything. And if a college professor stands up and says a translation can be inspired, that doesn't mean anything. He better prove it from this book. He better prove from this book that a, that a translation cannot be inspired, or he better prove from this book that a translation can be. I've proven from the book it can be proven three times. I told you there's about 30. Well, I base that on this. <clears throat> I base that on, on situations, most of them are Old Testament, when someone not of Jewish extraction was speaking... And they were speaking in their own country, and I'm, I'm assuming they were speaking in their own language. Good example, 2 Kings chapter 6. In 2 Kings chapter 6, the king of Syria wants to kill the king of Israel. So he sends, his, he sends a, a hit squad, and they lay for the king of Israel, and Elisha, the, uh, the uh, prophet, says, Hey, king, don't go down that road. king of Syria is going to kill you. And so he didn't go down that road. So the king of Syria says, Okay, then lay for him on that road. <clears throat> and he starts down that road, and Elisha says, Hey, king, don't go down that road. He's going to kill you. And finally, in frustration, you have the king of Syria, in Syria, talking to his people, his court, and saying, Hey, who here is on their side? This guy knows what I'm saying in my bedroom. Now, does anybody think that the king of Syria, who was a Syrian, speaking to Syrians, was speaking Hebrew? <laughs> I highly doubt he was speaking Hebrew. I have this wild notion he probably was speaking Syrian. Yeah, yeah. But the words are written in Hebrew. So that's an inspired translation. But the reason I don't use that one is because it doesn't say he said it in Syria. These three are irrefutable. You cannot refute that. Three inspired translations. So <clears throat> a translation can be inspired. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you what, too. Um, look, at, uh, look at Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. Now, Genesis chapter 22, this is where the Lord 
<coughs> told Abraham, I want you to take uh, uh, Isaac up on that mountain. I want you to offer me, uh, I want you to offer him, him to me as a sacrifice. And you know, they're on their way up the mountain. And remember what Isaac says, cool kid. He says, uh, hey Pop, we got the wood and we got the fire and we don't have a lamb. And Man, I wonder if the old man's going to do what he said he's going to do for years. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> verse 7, Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. All right? <clears throat> he says this, God will provide himself. God will provide Himself a lamb. Now, that's double speak. Because He said God's going to provide the lamb, right? But who did He say? He said God's going to be the lamb. That is a prophetic reference to Jesus Christ. Amen. That's not my opinion, and that's not your opinion. Yes, I will, I will be honest. Uh, being a Christian, I would want that to be a reference to Jesus Christ, but that's not a good reason to say it. You know how I know that's a reference to Jesus Christ? Because they never get a lamb in the passage. When they look up, it's a ram. The lamb does not show up for almost 2,000 years. So, you've got a, a, the, the King James Bible... Genesis 22, verse 8, says God will provide Himself a lamb. Alright? That's, uh, that's the AV. Alright? I'm going to give you the NIV and the New American Standard and the New King James. Oops. That was a Swedish Bible, the King James Version. <laughs> Alright, right. the NIV in that verse says God Himself. And we we got those. God Himself will provide the land. Well, that is saying that God is going to be the provider, which was true, correct? But you've lost the prophetic reference to Christ. God Himself will provide the lamb. Hey, Dad, where's the lamb we're going to sacrifice? Oh, God's going to provide it. But you lost a prophetic reference to Jesus Christ. Uh, the New American Standard, and by the way, I tell people all the time, the only good American Standard version is made out of porcelain. Okay? Uh, I passed in a church one time. We thought so highly of the American Standard Version that we built two entire rooms just for our American Standard Version. <laughs> in fact, I have, I've come to realize over the years you can use the American Standard and the King James at the same time. <laughs> and, the, and the New American Standard says God will provide for Himself. God will provide for Himself a lamb. Well, I'm going to be very semantically technical. God didn't need the lamb. It didn't need to be provided for Him. I know how He said it, but it didn't need to be provided for Him. It needed to be provided for you and me. <clears throat> so, again, you lose the prophetic reference to Jesus Christ. The New, New King James, uh, New King James claims to be uh, making a good thing better. What it should be is making a good thing read like the New American Standard. Because yeah. many of the changes to the New King James are, are directly uh, taken right out of the New American Standard. Therefore, the New King James says, provide for himself. Now, look at the superiority of the King James Bible. God will provide Himself a lamb. God Himself will provide a lamb. He'll provide, a lamb, uh, provide for Himself a lamb. Provide for Himself a lamb. you got four of them there. Only one of them has a prophetic reference to Jesus Christ, right? Yeah. Are you ready for this? The Hebrew, for the, for the King James Bible, the NIV, the American Standard, New King James, in, in Genesis chapter 22, verse 8, all reads the same. That prophecy, we didn't get that prophecy from Hebrew. We got that prophecy right there from English. I told you, I don't claim inspiration with the King James Bible, but I always say that'll do, you know, if you can't find inspiration in the King James Bible, that'll do till we can find it. Okay? 
okay? Because there's something there. All right, now, have you ever heard this? Uh, college professor. Well, now, people, you have to remember that, that what you have there in your lap is just a translation. And everybody knows that a translation can't be as good as the original. How many of you ever heard anybody say that? All right, question. Can a translation be as good as the original? Now, I know what you're thinking. See, because you're prejudiced in favor of the King James Bible. So you're just going to pop off and say, well, everybody, yeah, a translation can be as good as the original. How do you know? Where's your vote any better than a college professor? In fact, because he's educated, he thinks his vote's better than yours, and so does most of Christianity. Right? You know what we need? We need a final authority. Yeah. Boy, if we just had a final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Here's what I did. Uh, all right. All right. <laughs> I'll get something else. <laughs> All right, look here. Now, before we look at this study, you gotta, you got to think, guys. I'm telling you, I am so tired of Americans not thinking, of Bible believers not thinking. All right, that book right there, that songbook, that is the original. We are going to translate this book. So when we're done, we're going to have a translation, okay? Original translation. Then when we're done, this translation has to end up in one of three ways. I personally cannot think of a fourth. It has to end up inferior to the original, which is the standard teaching, right? Now you have to admit that that is a possibility. Yes. Or it has to end up equal, or it has to end up superior. Now if you even infer that, you're a heretic, because they can't take that. Doesn't matter what they think, doesn't matter what you think. Can you think of another way it could end up? I didn't say it's going to end up anyway. I said it has to end up inferior, equal, or superior. It's the only three ways it can end up. What we're going to do is find out what it does. All right. Uh, take a look at 2 Samuel chapter 3. Second Samuel chapter 3. You know what I did? I, I had this crazy idea along this line. Maybe if I just went to my final authority, no matter faith and practice, and looked up the word translation. And I found out how the translations ended up in the Bible. That kind of gives me an idea of how a translation ends up. Inferior, equal, or superior. The word translate appears in three places in Scripture. It appears five times, but it appears only three places. Now I'll show you those, all three of those, right now. That should give us. You know what's nice about three? You can't have a deadline. You can't have two and go, well, this one is, you know, this one is this, and this one is this. What do we do with the third one? All right, here's what happens. You know when uh, <clears throat> when Saul was killed in Gilgal in 1 Samuel chapter 31, uh, and his and his sons Jonathan, etc., Amminadab, uh, uh, Melchishua Mel were were killed. Uh, Amasa or Abner, Abner took uh, Ishbosheth, Saul's son, and installed him as a puppet king. And things were going good, and then him and Abner, uh, Abner and Ishbosheth had an argument. Abner, man, he got torqued. Here's what he says. He says this in verse 9, so do, to, uh, so do God to Abner, and more also, except as the Lord hath sworn to David, even so I do to him to translate the kingdom from the house of Saul and to set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan, <clears throat> even to Beersheba. So here's what he said. He said, I am going to translate the kingdom to David. Alright, now what was the original state? The original state was a divided kingdom, correct? We're not talking about the ten and two split that God later ordained. We're talking about David. God wanted David. Even Abner says in verse 9, he knew God wanted David over the entire king of Israel, correct? He knew that. So he said, in the original, you have a split kingdom, and after the translation, what do you have? you got David ruling over a united kingdom as God wanted it. All right, here's the original. Split kingdom. Here's the translation. David reigning over Israel. Was it... Well, first off, it can't be equal. Was it inferior? No, no, no. What was it? 
it was superior. All right. Uh, look with me, if you will, to uh, Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1. And this is the second time that the word translate appears in Scripture. Look at verse 13. It says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Right. That's salvation. Right? Yes. Alright. Now let me ask you a question. Just think about your own case. Original. Original. You and I were in the power of darkness. We were on our way to hell. Yes. Okay, after you got saved, well, that couldn't be equal. No, that's right. So what was it? Was it inferior? Was it superior? Yeah. Guys, two times now, the translation was superior. In fact, just for a thought, <clears throat> just, just for something before you think about, uh, if, if anybody ever says a translation can't be inspired, you know what you ought to tell them? I am one. <laughs> I am an inspired translation. I have been translated by God from what I was, the power of darkness. I have been translated <clears throat> into the kingdom of His dear Son. Alright, now look at the last one. And this is in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. This is the, this is the third place in the last uh, third, fourth, and fifth time that the word translate appears in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5. It's talking about Enoch and it says this, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Alright, so you know what we call that? Don't we call that a type of rapture? Yep. So, what was the original? The original was Enoch on a sin-cursed earth that the Bible describes that man's imagination was only evil continually. Right? right? After his translation, he was never going to die and he was living in heaven in the presence of God. Alright, first off, we know it's not the same. It's not equal. Is it inferior? What is it? Superior. Superior. Guys, the word translate appears three times in the Bible. One, two, and three. All three times the translation is every time superior to the original. My final authority on, in all matters of faith and practice, including the practice of translation, tells me that a translation is superior to the original. In fact, <clears throat> that leads me to a... to a... Uh, a three-point sermon that I have called Three Translations You Need That Are Better Than a King James Bible. You need, number one, you need salvation. Isn't that the first one? You need to be saved. But you know what? After you're saved, you know what, you know what we preachers are always telling you to do? We're always telling you to transfer your kingdom over there where moth and rust doth not corrupt and thieves do not break through and steal. Right? And then, aren't you waiting for what? You're waiting to be translated physically. So, <clears throat> there's a three-point message found in your King James Bible. Three translations that are better than the Bible. Salvation, translate your kingdom, and the rapture. But I had a thought. See, I think, and I have thoughts. You know what thought I had? And I, I sometimes my thoughts are humorous. <laughs> you probably never noticed, but... Here was my thought. Now imagine this. Imagine that you are a modern translator. You are a pro NIV, New American Standard, uh, Alexandrian manuscripts, critical text stuff, anti-King James, anti-infallible Bible, blah, blah, blah. And your job is to translate the entire Bible. You're making a brand new translation. And one of the things you don't believe is you don't believe a translation can be superior to the original. It's got to be inferior, correct? Yeah. What do you do when you come to those three places in the Bible? That's got to be pretty interesting. Amen. They must snort glue when they come to those three. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you what they do, and it is funny. <clears throat> you don't have to turn back, but in, um, in 2 Samuel chapter 3, where it says to translate 
the kingdom from the house of Saul and set, over, uh, set up uh, the throne of David over Israel and over Judah. In the New King James Version, it doesn't say translate. It says transfer the kingdom. Now, you can transfer a kingdom, but you can't transfer your kingdom. You guys that, uh, you guys that give money, don't you believe that you're going to have something for what you give on the other side? Do you believe you're going to have it? Do you think you're going to have $20 bills waiting for you? No. no. Do, you, do you want to transfer this to heaven? Could you imagine, look, guys, could you imagine getting to heaven and finding every, every penny you ever gave waiting in a vault for you? <laughs> and what are you going to do with it? You don't want it transferred. You want it what? Translated. Translated. Amen. And the Lord is going to translate it. Um, and so that's what the uh, New King James does with 2 Samuel. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, who had delivered us from the power of darkness, the New American Standard says, and, and has transferred us into the kingdom. Transfer? You know what I could do? I think I could do this. I could move to this area and I could, I could transfer my membership to this church from the church that I'm a member of in Ohio. We call that transfer membership, uh, uh, joining by letter. Okay? But here's the problem with that. Sometimes you get lost members. Really? You get lost members. You get a guy who was lost and, and somehow got into a Baptist church and then moved out of state and, and he's a member of a good church and he comes and joins and the guy's not even saved. Guys, you can't be transferred spiritually into the kingdom of heaven. You've got to be translated. Amen. Guys, aren't you different than what you were? Amen. It's because you were translated. You were changed. But the best one, and this is my favorite. I love this one. This is the New International. Hebrews chapter 11. And, and you know what I'm going to do? If I can find it here, I'm going to read it for you because it is a crack. I can get this open. Uh, I think it might not be in this one. Okay. Now forgive me because this these briefcases are just shot and they don't work well. But I do have my new international version. And you gotta read this because you're gonna grow spiritually by leaps and bounds. <laughs> Hebrews chapter, five, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life, so that he did not experience death. Uh, he could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, and, and when I was a kid, now some of you never heard it, but, but I remember we had this song called, They're Coming to Take Me Away, Oh, They're Coming to Take Me Away, Oh, The Funny Farm. And, uh, <clears throat> and so they took him away. <laughs> All right, now guys, guys, I tell you, think, 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 think. Do you want to be taken to heaven? Or do you want to be translated to heaven? Now I know what you're going to say. You're immediately going to say translated because that's what we're dealing with and you, want to, and, and you know the translation is better. But think about this. What would happen if the rapture happened right now and you were going to be taken to heaven in the body you have now? <laughs> that would leave an impression. <laughs> right? I mean, it would be... <laughs> Whoa, maybe, there's, maybe that's why there's a bunch of trumpets. You know, you hear the trumpet, go for the door! <laughs> and hope you're not in an airplane or a submarine. <laughs> I mean, hey, they didn't make it through the church. Try it again. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> you know, years ago, you know that Wizard of Id, that uh, that yeah. comic with the yeah. with the knight and the little king, and it showed uh, Rodney the knight, and he had a he had a broken table leg and a burnt wagon wheel, and he said, "Here, O oh king, we burned and pillaged the village, and here's what we got." And in the next panel, he's hanging upside down in the dungeon, going, "Pillage, then burn." Pillage, then burn. <laughs> they burned it, then they pillaged it. <laughs> well, you know, it's like, uh, better change them before you bring them up. <laughs> right? Look, do you want 
not travel through space. Go on outside. Go on outside. Rapture's going to happen. We hear the trumpet. We make it out of the parking lot. Do you want to travel through space in his body? No. You don't want to be translated or transferred. You don't want to be taken. You want to be translated. You know why? Because uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 21 says that he's going to liken our body, change our body, liken, to be likened unto his glorious body, and his glorious body could pass right through that ceiling and not disturb a molecule. That's right. Boy, you want that trump, but believe me, you want to be translated. You don't want to be taken. But furthermore, God did not want Enoch to die. Correct? Yeah. Didn't want him to see death. So he translated him to heaven. Did you, ever, did, you, did you ever stop and think what would have happened if Enoch had not been translated to heaven and had only been taken? If God could have put a little bubble around him and brought him up through space and they deposited him in heaven and here's God sitting on the throne and they said, uh, Lord, he's here. Enoch, we got him. Send him in. Enoch steps in the presence of God and goes... <laughs> And down he goes, right? That's right? What would happen if you saw God in this body? That's you right. would die. Amen. And here's God going, Oh, bummer. <laughs> I didn't want him to die. I should have translated him. Yeah. Three translations in the Bible. And every time the translation was not equal. And it was not inferior. It was superior to the original. Now see, that's why before you begin... If you talk to somebody about translations and they say translation can't be inspired or, or translation can't be as good as the original, don't say, oh yes, they can. You say this. Do you accept the Bible as your final authority in all matters of faith and practice? Oh, of course I do. Good. <laughs> and then take them to the final authority. Oh, wait a second. Wait a second. Here's the original. And here's King James Bible. According to what the Bible taught. Here's the original. Where should I put this King James Bible? Is it equal to the original? No. Well, that's one place where we and the adversaries agree. They don't think it's equal, and we don't either. Is it inferior? No. no. It's what? Superior. It's got to be superior. So, I'm going to show you five reasons why that King James Bible, why that translation is superior. Now listen to what I said and don't hear what I did not say. I did not say that the translation is more inspired. I didn't say the King James Bible is more inspired than, than the original. I said it is superior to the original. And there are five ways. There might be six or seven. I haven't thought of any more. I've tried, 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 and tried, and I come up with five. All right, the first one is this. It's all in one volume. You guys do understand that never, not one time in history, ever, was Moses' copy of Genesis bound in a book with John's copy of Revelation and everything in between the 66 books that we know. You do understand that there was never a time in history when the 66 originals were bound in one volume where a guy could carry around and say, look, I got all the originals in my hand. Never. Yeah. The Bible that, 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 that historians and fundamentalists, etc. talk about didn't really exist. So, look at this. I am holding every word of God in one hand. Yeah. If we had the originals of every book in this Bible, I still couldn't do this. Right. I could not hold the whole... This, guys, I can take... I carry one hand. I, I can open up right there. I've got every word of God. That is superior to the originals. Alright. Hang on a second. Secondly, chapter and verse markings. Do you know how hard the studies we've done would do would be if I couldn't say, turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, you know there were no chapter and verse markings in the original? Yes. Do you know how hard it would be? Look how fast you find We have Bible drills over that stuff, don't we? Yeah. Now, could you imagine this? Could you imagine? Uh, uh, I like these scrolls, you know. But could you imagine your pastor gets up to preach this Sunday out of Isaiah? And he says, uh, open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 33, which you can't even identify. Right? right. Well, let's say you could. Chapter 33. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, and he reads, says, okay, go back to chapter 2. 
<laughs> yeah, go for it. Okay. No, chapter 66. <laughs> Guys, chapter and verse markings, are they, they make our translation, by the way, any translation, they make it superior to the original. Okay, also, that book, that translation is more durable. It's more durable. He said it doesn't mean anything. Oh, really? You know, I had, uh, last Bible that I had, <clears throat> uh, I started using this one about three years ago, but um, uh, the one I had before, it, I, I kept for 14 years. 14 years. I am telling you that if I had the originals done on vellum and papyrus and everything else, I could not have, have carried it with me, put it on the floor of my van, preached out of it every single night, I mean the, the words, the ink would have been smudged away, the papyrus would have fragmented, it never would have lasted 14 years. This is more durable than the original. I'll tell you something else about this. It's in English. You understand that more people speak English than ever spoke Hebrew and Greek? Yep. I was reading an article, you know, right now the uh, communist Chinese, our good, fun, our good friends, are good friends of this government, <laughs> Are, uh, are cracking down on home churches and it showed this church and it had a police van right in front of this church in China, in, in, in Peking. And, and on the side of that police van it had a bunch of Chinese figures that I assume say, you know, we're the cops. <laughs> but you know what else it had underneath that? In China, in a country that despises this nation, it said Capital Patrol Police. In English, mm. in China, mm -hmm. huh. to a bunch of Chinese. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because more people speak English than anybody. Yeah. That never spoke Hebrew, ever spoke Greek. Amen. Uh, I, in fact, I talked to a, a man. He was uh, he's a missionary to China, married a Chinese girl. And I don't mean this disrespectfully, but if you saw this lady, you know, you would go. Uh, he'd say, you know, this is my wife, and you would go, How do you like America? <laughs> And she would go, oh, it's fine, fine, I love it. I love Whoppers. Boy, we don't have one in China. She speaks English just like you and me. You know where she learned it? Public school in China. Mm -hmm. I, I had some businessman. Guys, will you quit? Look, the news media beats our country up enough. Amen. Yeah. yeah. I don't care if it's the news media. I don't care if it's the, the automotive press, you know, to, to Motor Trend and, and Car Driver, an American can't build a car right. And to our news media, enough Americans can't do anything right. Will you quit beating America up too? And I had some chump, just because he's not thinking, because he's been trained to smash America all the time. And he says he was a, he was a businessman, and he's in this motel, and he's at the pool. And this Japanese guy is swimming, and they get talking, and they're in business, same business. And here's what this Japanese guy does. He reaches into his bathing suit into a pocket and pulls out a plastic laminated business card. And hands it to him. And this guy goes now. He goes, see, that's the difference between them and us. That guy thought of having a plastic laminated business card. And I said, in what language? Mm. Amen. That <laughs> wasn't Japanese, bucko. Mm -hmm. Okay? <clears throat> so by being in English, this is superior to the original. Mm -hmm. You want to know how superior? Bring the original in. And I'd like everybody in here, or anybody in here, to read me five verses from it. <laughs> Hebrew or Greek. I didn't say get a Greek New Testament and read it from the one you had in college. I said read it from the original because the original ain't nothing like the one you had in college. Okay? And then there's another reason, the fifth reason that this, this translation is superior to the original and I'm not going to show you. You're going to show me. Hold your Bible up. Hold your Bible up. Look around. Look around. Okay, guys, think about it. Multiple copies. If, if, and it never happened, but if there was a time in history when, when Moses' copy of Genesis was in abiding with John's copy of Revelation, if there was a time when there was one volume of the Bible, and there never was, but if there was a time in history when the original was in one volume, there'd be just that, one volume. And here we've all got one. And I guarantee you, everybody that held one up, you probably got another one at home. I don't mean another modern version. I mean you got the one your dad gave to you, your, your parents gave to you when you're eight, you're eight years old, 
or you got the one that you had that didn't have a, a, a note system in it, so now you got a note system, or you got the one you just wore out and you start, started using this one, correct? Mm -hmm. Guys, that is, that's where a translation, not more inspired, but that's where a translation is superior to the original. But you should have known that, because in our final authority, no matter faith and practice, every single time, the translation was superior to the original. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. How far is I supposed to go? Far as you want. I won't go to Kansas. Go <laughs> on. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll tell you what we'll do. <clears throat> we'll do one more here. Um, have you ever heard this tria? Tria. Now the King James Bible has archaic words in it, <laughs> and we need to update those archaic words. All right. Now on the on the other side of that, uh, our guys will be dishonest. And we'll say, oh, there's no archaic words in the King James Bible. Guys, there are archaic words in the King James Bible. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> now, let's see if I've got this or if I need my notebook. Hang on a second. Okay, now I don't think there are near as many archaic words as our adversaries say that there are, but try this one. Try this one. Um, you have to admit that um, uh, asunder is something we don't use very much. Uh, we don't say not very much. We don't, we don't even say usury or trafficked, with that K especially. And we don't say um, thee and thine and shalt and uh, whence and, and yea, as the Bible says it. Uh, we don't say gad much. We don't say satiate or see it or seethe. <clears throat> There's a lot of things in the Bible that we don't say anymore. Right? We don't use them that way. Now, I will say this. A bunch of the words that they say are archaic, we do use. Uh, it was a few years ago, I picked up a paper, and it showed this guy jogging barefooted. And, it, and you know what the headline was? Runner eschews shoes. <laughs> that is King James English, guys. Amen. But... To pretend that there aren't archaic words in the King James Bible is dishonest. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And it says this, look at verse 25. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. Now guys, <clears throat> we don't say shambles anymore, unless you're describing a certain part of town. But... Um, <laughs> But we don't say shambles. But you know what a shambles was in the Bible days? That was the marketplace. That was the meat market, the grocery store. Okay? And, and we don't say shambles anymore. Now, here's what, a, here's what a adversary will say. They'll say, see, right there. That's why you need, you need a modern translation. Well, first off, I don't think anybody here had their spiritual growth stunted by the word shambles. Okay? But the second thing is this. And so here's what they say. They're, they're, they say... What we need is a modern translation. All right, I told you, you don't want to put more emphasis on something than God does. Well, there's another rule. Let me give you this one. You get into trouble when you think you have a better way of handling something than God does. Some of you have had situations in your life and you tried to take care of it yourself and didn't you mess up because you didn't like the way God was doing it? Correct? So, if we can go to the Bible, which is our what? Final authority in all matters of faith and... Right. No, really, guys. You think the Bible tells us what to do with archaic words? Well, not really. You can't, you can't say it does or doesn't. You know what you have to say? If it doesn't, then I don't know how to take care of it. And if it does, then I've got to follow that practice. Right. Well, it does. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9. And in 1 Samuel chapter 9, we are going to run into an archaic word. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, it says this, Now there was a man of Benjamin, whose name was Kish, the son of Abiah, the son of Zorah, the son of Bacharath, the son of Aphia, Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly, and there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. Uh, from his shoulders and upward he was higher than any of the people. And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to Saul his son, Take now one of the servants with thee, and arise, go seek the asses. So here's what happens. This is Kish, he has these jackasses, donkeys, 
And, and they get lost, they wander away, so he gets his kid, and he says, take one of the servants and go find them. Now, he must have been a teenager, because he couldn't even find his way out of the room, okay? Uh, he traveled all over the place, verse 4, and verse 5, uh, he traveled all over the place and could not find him. And he finally says at the end of verse 5, uh, middle of it, uh, Come, let us return, lest my father leave caring for the asses and take thought for us. And then it says this in verse 6, And he said unto him, this is the servant, Behold now, there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he, hath, uh, all that he saith cometh surely to pass. Now let us go thither, peradventure, uh, he can show us our way that we should go. And what I'm about to read you, what I'm about to read you is a wonderful Bible practice that we don't practice anymore. Wonderful practice. Look at verse 7. Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? Isn't that wonderful? You know, you know, if everybody that asked a preacher a question had to pay to do it, we wouldn't get them stupid questions. <laughs> You guys have no idea. I mean, you will call a preacher and talk to him for two hours about acting. You'll talk to him about the stupidest stuff. I had a guy one time come to me and he said, uh, pray for me, preacher. I said, what's the matter? He goes, well, everything's gone good. <laughs> I said, yeah. He goes, well, you know when things are going good, something bad's going to happen. So I punched him in the mouth. Anyway, I don't want to destroy his expectation. I mean, I mean, waste a guy's time with that kind of stuff. And you come up with this stuff like, you know, like, uh, what do I do if, let's say, a UFO lands in my backyard? That's, that's easy. Get back on. <laughs> but really, you know, you know, you guys, you'll call and, and you'll talk for an hour and a half, and, and, and I'm sorry, wouldn't it be nice? It would just be so nice if you had to pay. <laughs> it really would. Oh well, we'll never get that one reestablished. <laughs> Verse seven. Then said Saul to his servant, I'll be, "But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we?" You know that verse was inspired, by the way. I just oh, <laughs> in Hebrew, God breathed it. <clears throat> now. Before I continue to read, here's what I want you to notice. Look, just look. Look at verse 8, look at verse 9, and look at verse 10. What do you notice different about verse 9? It's in parentheses. That's right. You know what a parenthesis is? A parenthesis is a note from the writer to the reader. Now, that's kind of odd that you could write to somebody and then, in, in fact, write them a note too. But that's true. Uh, let's say I was writing somebody a letter today, and I said, I'm in, uh, I'm in uh, Richfield, Washington, parenthesis, at Tim Shanks Church, parenthesis. Okay? And you know what I love about the Bible? I really do, guys. God not only wrote the Bible to us, but every now and then, He put us a little note. That is so neat. That God is right, and He goes, oh, Gip will never understand this. I'm I better explain this. <laughs> that's right. He did, they did that for me, and He Amen. did that for you. Amen. Now, now get this. A parenthesis is not a necessary portion of the narrative. In other words, if the parenthesis is not there, the narrative is not violated. Don't worry, verse 9 is inspired. I'm not saying it's not inspired. I said it's not part of the narrative. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read verse 8, and then I'm going to read verse 10. I'm not going to read verse 9. Only to show you how the narrative flows without verse 9. Look at verse 8. And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. That will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. Then said Saul to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went unto the city where the man of God was. <clears throat> you notice how there was, no, there was no blip. It wasn't like, a lot of times, if you just take a verse out of, the, out of the scripture and you got a hole in the narrative, this leaves no hole because the parenthesis is just that. It's a note. But it's a necessary note. Because God knows you and I are about to run into an archaic word. And look what he says in the note to you and I. Verse 9. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come, let us go uh, to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. At the time that, that Saul and his servant are going to see the man of God, he is known as a seer. Right? But by the time this was put in pen and ink, the word seer has passed from common usage. Now they call that guy a prophet. That has happened in this country. 
Uh, 150 years ago, um, if somebody saw Pastor Shanks or Pastor Glenn on the street, they would say, hello, Parson. They called them Parson. That's right. We don't use that anymore. You know, you might take your car to the repairman and, and some guy will be joking, hello there, Parson, but, but it's archaic. We don't say Parson anymore. We say Pastor or Preacher. So Parson is archaic. So, so seer is an archaic term. Now let's read, uh, we'll read verse 9 again. We'll continue with the text. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Then Saul said to his servant, Well said, Come, let us go. So they went unto the city where the man of God was. And as they went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water, and said unto them, Is the prophet here? Is the seer here? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't say prophet, does it? It says seer. God left the archaic word in the text. Mm -hmm. Correct? Amen. I mean, this happened in the original. God, God put an archaic word in the original. Now, did you ever think this, guys? Did you ever just think, wouldn't it have been easier? It would seem easier to me. And, and this is the way our, our, our adversarial friends would say it. Wouldn't it have been easier to just not bother inspiring verse 9? And when you had the guy write the original, just have him say prophet. But God Himself wouldn't change one word of the text. That's right. Well, what do you think you're doing? Changing one word of the text. Yeah. Look at verse 18. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is. So there's two opportunities that God had to change the text, and He did not change the text. So, what is the Bible practice for archaic words? Well, if your pastor, any preacher, is going to be preaching, let's say, out of, a, out of, out of a, a 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and he gets down to verse 25, and it says, that which is sold in the shambles, there's nothing wrong to say, now what they call the shambles, we call the marketplace. That is just defining the word. It's wrong if he continues on and says, now we need, scratch shambles out of your Bible and write marketplace there. Or, this is an example of why we need a modern translation. No. No. Don't change the text. Right. Yeah. So, we have God's example on archaic words. But I have to do tell you that, I, you know, I did. I said I wouldn't fool you. And I already did. I did. I fooled you. You remember when I read, I read you and I mentioned some archaic words like uh, shalt and thee and thine and verily? That's a list of archaic words in four modern translations. I didn't tell you from the King James Bible. <laughs> I've got a list, and, and I'll give this to you, preacher. You have a copy machine? Yes. Okay, we'll copy this and give everybody a copy. Archaic words found in the New International Version, 1973. Archaic words found in the American Standard Version, um, 1960 or 63. Uh, archaic words in the New King James Version, 1982. Archaic words in the, in the, the New Revised Standard Version, 1999. And I, I stopped at 30. I only put 30 archaic words that are found in those modern translations. Now, you know what this, this, this little piece of paper proves two very important things. Number one, guys that say they don't like archaic words are lying. Because they only criticize the archaic words in a King James Bible. They never criticize the archaic words in a modern translation. If they really were upset about archaic words, wouldn't they say, Ah, oh, it's stupid New American Standard Version that says, Shalt and thee, and I'm so sick of those thee and thou from the New American Standard Version. <laughs> You've never heard that. You'll never hear it in your life. Yep. But you don't understand. You haven't caught up what's really important about this. You know what this proves? Every single one of these translations, when it was done, one of the goals was to eliminate the archaic words. And they couldn't do it. Therefore, if I really believed that these archaic words in the King James Bible were a real problem to us, and I wish we could get rid of them, I would know by example, it can't be done. It cannot. If a guy said today, come on guys, think about it. How come somebody would say right now, uh, you know, we're going to translate a Bible here in 2005, and, and we're going to get rid of these archaic words. Wouldn't you say, I thought that was done and done and done and done. Right. Nobody ever did it. Nobody can do it. So if you thought it needed to be done, give up. Because it can't be done. I'll leave this out where we can get to it. 
But there's even something better than that. I like this. What if God preferred our cave words? <laughs> now, we know He allowed one. We don't necessarily know that He preferred the word seer here, but we do know that He allowed it and explained it in the text. But what if, what if an archaic word was God's preference? You don't want to mess with God's preference now, do you? Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 29. 2 Chronicles chapter 29. is 350 years after 1 Samuel chapter 9. Guys, it's archaic back then. It's going to be archaic 350 years later. 350 years after the word seer passed off the scene and became archaic, look what the Lord says and look at the context. Well, well, I'm going to read you this one first. Verse 30. Moreover, Hezekiah the king and the, and the uh, princes commanded the Levites to sing praise unto the Lord with the, with the words of David and of Asaph the... 350 years after things, this thing's out of date. God inspired the writer of Second Chronicles to use an archaic word. But that's not even a good one. The good one's five verses earlier. Look at verse 25. And he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with psalteries, with harps, according to the commandment of David and of Gad the king's seer, and of Nathan the prophet. Oh, isn't that cool? He used them both in the same verse. <laughs> just so he, just so you know. Because he would say, well, maybe the writer didn't know that seer was archaic. Man, he had to. He put prophet and, and, and seer in the same verse. And seer was archaic for 350 years. You know what that tells me? God preferred an archaic word. Now guys, if God prefers an archaic word, you know what? You, you take that archaic word out of there, that's kind of like what we were talking about Jehudi and the king. Jehudi don't want to cut something up and throw it away when the king likes what it says or want to hear what it says. And I got news for you. You go yank an archaic words out of, out of the Bible and God's going to say, wait a minute, stupid. I put archaic words in the Bible. What do you, who do you think you are? You think you're God's dentist here? Going to yank out everything it is and want it? So, people, in the Bible, the Bible practice, our final authority in all matters of faith and practice, for taking care of archaic words is identify the word and explain what it means today. But never say it's a mistake or it's wrong or needs to be replaced or, or we need a modern translation. That's saying I've got a better way to take care of it than God. You ain't got a better way to take anything, take care of anything than God. People went to hell because they thought a better way of salvation than God had. Okay? So, that's that. And we'll have the pastor... Uh, Copy these for you, preach, you can come and you can dismiss us.